Uh, and this is our first ever inaugural uh, Better Together webinar series. Uh, this is hosted by the Beta Cell Foundation. I am the founder and CEO, Craig Steubing. You probably know me from uh, the Beta Cell podcast. Um, the point of the Beta Cell Foundation is really to be a place to celebrate the type 1 diabetes community. Um, mostly through things that people are doing for the community. So this Better Together series is a way to celebrate the healthcare workers uh, with type 1 diabetes who are making the world a better place and seeing what we can learn from them about living with diabetes better. Um, I'm sure people will be trickling in uh, as we get started, so I might repeat myself later, but uh, there's a chat function if you want to say hi or chat with us. We also have in Zoom at the bottom a Q&A button. If you have questions you want to ask um, that only we will see, um, send those along uh, at any point. The way we're going to start this is um, Christy has a short presentation, um, and then she and I are going to, I'm going to have some questions for her, and then we're going to open it up for everyone else. Um, don't be shy. Um, so uh, Christy, um, she has had type one diabetes since she was one year old, right? Yes. Um, which is uh, a long time to have type one diabetes. Uh, you can actually hear all about her story. She was actually on one of the beta cell podcast shows uh, with her mom. It was awesome. I think it was a life-changing experience for Christy. Um, <laughs> But uh, Christy is here today because she's a licensed clinical social worker at a children's hospital. Um, so she is um, combining her 28 years of life with diabetes and her social work degree to kind of help us. Before we get started, uh, Christy, do you think that your decision to go into social work was affected? by having type one diabetes? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think it was kind of a, almost a trickle down effect when I think about it. Um, I attended camp for kids with type one diabetes since I was three, I wanna say was the first family camp I went to. And that really, you know, I've always loved kids, but working there as a counselor really made me think I really want to work with kids and I like working with kids with diabetes and I like helping people. So I, in college was kind of torn between psychology and journalism and writing. Cause I like to write too, but I, I remember specifically like sitting in class one day and watching a video of like somebody working with a kid and it was in a psychology class. And I was like, all right, this is it. This is what I want to do. So you know, my experiences with diabetes led me to the hospital that I work at now. It's where my outpatient endocrinology clinic was. And, um, you know, my parents actually suggested, you, you know, see if you could volunteer there, see if you could work with families with kids with diabetes, because that's something they actually were exposed to when I was first diagnosed. And they said it was just so helpful. So when I started volunteering there, I, um, you know, cause I was looking for experience and, you know, where in psychology do I want to go and what's next. And I was, I ended up volunteering with the social worker at the endocrinology clinic. And it all just kind of clicked that I learned, you know, what social work is and how mental health ties into that. And, you know, what, how broad of a field it is. And one thing led to another and now I'm here. I think, uh, you know, mental health is one of those things that we hear about a lot, uh, mm -hmm. especially in 2020. Um, it's important. Um, I think it's one of those things we, we know is important. We don't really necessarily know what to, know what to do from that. Um, but you, you are here to help us at least start down this path. Um, you have a short presentation you're going to start with, right? Yes. You can uh, take over whenever you're ready. I am going to now share my screen. So here we go. Share. Okay. 
You guys can see it okay? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. So, oh, it started at the end. Oh boy. Okay. I was telling Craig, I haven't done a PowerPoint in maybe like six years. So just bear with me, but it's very brief. So let me just get back to the beginning. Okay. And for everyone who's joined us since I started, um, Christy, Christy's here. She's going to uh, share her presentation. Um, if you have questions at all during her presentation, you can use the Q&A button in Zoom and we'll get those uh, as they come in and we'll ask them at the end. All yours, Christy. Okay. Okay. So I know Craig kind of introduced the series and what it is and a little bit about what we're doing here today. So like I said, I just wanted to do something very brief just to kind of bring us into what we're talking about while we're talking about it. Um, so first of all, so who am I? I'm again, my name is Christy. I'm a type one diabetic. I have had diabetes since I was about 13 months old for almost 28 years now. Um, I'm a licensed clinical social worker. So as I said before, social work is a very broad field. So um, there's kind of a million different things you could do in it. For me, working in a hospital, um, primary role is psychosocial assessments, um, crisis intervention, which is takes up a lot of my time because I am primarily in the emergency room, uh, the pediatric emergency room, um, some care management and psychotherapy. So, you know, therapy, what a lot of people ask versus psychiatry is, you know, talk therapy weekly, semi-week or bi-weekly um, to address different mental health issues. Um, I'm a runner where I try to be. I did my first half in March, 2019 and was hoping for a full marathon in 2020, but that obviously didn't happen. Um, and I am a professional coffee drinker and a mom to one cat and two little humans who I'll, I'll talk about for hours if you guys let me. So I won't start. Um, so why diabetes and mental health? So like Craig said, mental health is really kind of coming up now as a big thing that everyone's talking about and everybody, um, you know, knows is important, but doesn't really know why maybe, or, you know, what's next? What does that mean that mental health is important? So in particular, diabetes and mental health, any chronic illness really can lead to tons of psychosocial complications. So, you know, psychological, um, different feelings, different emotions, different moods, uh, interpersonal, you can have relationships affected by your chronic illness, whatever it may be. Financial, so, you know, we all know the financial burden that could be placed on people um, if they can't afford their medical supplies. And these things kind of all can turn into a cycle as well. So, you know, you struggle with your finances, you're gonna have a higher level of stress, which means you're gonna have more psychological barriers and then you may have more difficulty in relationships. So it kind of can turn into a little bit of a vicious loop. Um, also, you know, mental health issues can be pre-existing before somebody's diagnosed with diabetes or, can kind of exist outside of diabetes. So, you know, you may have depression, anxiety, OCD, bipolar, you know, things that exist that don't necessarily tie into your diabetes. But the reason that I, you know, like to talk about them together is because it will almost always affect your diabetes management and vice versa, because those diagnoses take up such a big part of your life as diabetes does. And, you know, diabetes is hard. So when you have to deal with a hard thing, you typically tend to get stressed out, whether it's a healthy level of stress or a normal level of stress, you know, stress is a part of a diabetic's life. So just for reference, I, I put in um, two pictures from my Instagram where I had asked about diabetes and guilt, and it really showed how many people have 
felt at one point or another, like a burden on their loved ones, which is a huge component, not just of diabetes and mental health, but a lot of other chronic illnesses. Um, and that if it's a, you know, if it's a bad day, that's the time that they really feel like that, which also can mean that, you know, it's something that could be addressed. And on a good day, they aren't necessarily struggling with that. So, you know, there's, there's ways to help and there's ways to move forward. So obviously the past year has been, I mean, I think this meme has just been blaring in my mind for all of 2020 because it's so applicable. Um, we've had an incredible increase in stress, whether, you know, no matter where we work, no matter what we do, um, primarily because of the pandemic among other things still. Um, but, you know, there's hope. People don't realize that, you know, humans are very resilient. All humans of all ages, kids are incredibly resilient, young adults, regular adults, older adults. Um, and if you kind of take a pause to really think about all that you're doing to take care of yourself, you know, between your diabetes management and to take care of yourself in this reality that we're living in right now, where, you know, we have a pandemic, the likes of which we haven't seen since, you know, the Spanish flu. And the fact that you're here and you're, you know, making it through is pretty remarkable in itself. Um, and the fact that, you know, there's a phenomenon we call post-traumatic growth that focuses on, you know, the, the positive things and things that developed after trauma or significant stress that inevitably happen as well. So, you know, I think we've all grown this year, most of us, uh, whether we've been to or not, because it's something that we've never had to go through before. So, so let's talk about it. So something I wanted to do as a touch point, you know, just to kind of show an example of how how we could kind of all get caught up in our heads is little activity. So um, I don't think anyone's cameras are on, but if they are, if you want to turn them off, that's okay. But to start, okay, take your hand and hold it up to your nose so that it's, you know, touching your nose. And what do you see? Do you see your hand or does it kind of just look like a blob? Can you see the lines of your palm? Can you read them? Can you count how many fingers you have? And then move your hand back slowly until it's maybe about a foot from your face and compare the difference from then to now. So can you count your fingers? Can you see what color your hand is? What, what the lines, how many lines are on your palms? And what this kind of shows is that the, the closer we are to something, the, you know, the more enmeshed with it we are, the harder it is for us to see it. And when it's harder for us to see something, clearly it's scarier. You know, we're, we're all more comfortable, people say, with the devil we know. So the more you create that distance between yourself and whether it's diabetes or COVID or both or something stressing you out and realize that you are you and this is whatever outside factor it is and, you know, take a step back from it because that's how you're going to really examine it and ultimately it'll become less scary to you. Um, so yeah, so let's Let's talk about it, whatever else you guys want to talk about. And that's, that's my brief little presentation. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Awesome. Thank you, Christy. Um, a lot of good points. I think, you know, just looking at my notes here, you know, I think specifically for people with type one diabetes, what's hard is that you know, diabetes, we, we can't escape it in the same way, right? Like if COVID's a thing, we can find a, a house in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the Arctic and, you know, bring all of our food for a year and just hang out and then it's not going to bother us. But diabetes is like the one thing in our lives we can't leave. If you don't like your job, you quit your job. If you don't like where you live, you move. 
you right. know, um, if you don't like your boyfriend or girlfriend, you break up, right. you can't break up with diabetes. So I think that is hard. And I, and I think most people's first issue with diabetes is that realization that they can't get rid of it. Right. Like I see that all the time. People say, I just realized I have to do this forever. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that's, that is a very, you know, stunning realization. I, and I, it's funny that you say it because I even remember back when I was maybe like seven, I want to say giving myself a shot and being a small child and having this realization that I'm going to have to do a lot of these shots for the rest of my life. And like, what if one day I just don't want to do them anymore? And I, and I just stop. And in my little seven-year-old head, I was like, okay, well, whatever. And moved on. But, you know, I think that as people with diabetes, we kind of have those moments in life where we have that realization and it is, you know, very difficult to come to terms with, but, you know, to, to kind of reframe it, we do have choices as far as, you know, we can choose not to take our shots, not to take our insulin, not to test our blood sugar. And, you know, that choice would lead to other consequences, but, you know, you, it's sometimes helpful to remind yourself that you're choosing every day to take care of yourself. And that's really powerful thing. And that's a really strong thing that you're doing. You know, even when you're not testing maybe as often as your doctors say you should, or you're not changing your lancet as often as you should, you know, you're still getting up every day and making that decision to keep living. Yeah, that's powerful. Um, I've never heard it that way before. Um, you know, and you, you, you said this idea of being enmeshed with something. I don't know if everyone else here, you know, I did the, you know, hand thing. I've got smudges on my glasses now from that. Um, okay. how do you, how do you make distance with diabetes though? Um, because you're like, you know, stuck with it besides just ignoring it, which right. as you said, can make its own problems. Right. And you know, what, what I, I've said to people before, whether it's patients or, you know, peers is that ignoring diabetes is like I said, a choice, but if you're looking for, you're ignoring it because you want it to take up less of your life, the opposite is kind of going to happen because if you ignore it, then it's going to take up way more of your life. Maybe not right away, but somewhere down the line, but you know, creating distance with diabetes, it's, it's hard because like you said, it lives literally within our bodies and it's a constant in our lives, but, you know, kind of looking at it as something that happened to you and not you yourself, you know, you have to, and, and it takes effort to reframe it that way, you know, really watching your language and how you talk to yourself and how you talk to others and reminding yourself that, you know, I, I am angry. I'm angry at my blood sugar being high and versus I'm angry that I'm high again, uh, or I, what did I do wrong that my blood sugar is high or, you know, my, I, I am such a burden on my family and reframing that to my diabetes is a burden on me and my family and my diabetes isn't me. It's a part of me, but kind of creating that, like you said, that distance. Yeah. Um, I just want to take this point to remind everyone, if you have questions, uh, send them along, raise your hand if you want to chat. Um, otherwise it's just going to be all of my questions, which I'm okay with. Um, I think what makes diabetes particularly awful is that it seems like everything tends to snowball when one thing goes wrong. If, you know, let's say you have um, a bad night's sleep, you go, you know, high or you go low through no fall of your own, 
you don't get a you don't get a lot of sleep. And so you wake up in the morning, your dawn phenomenon's awful. So then you you have to correct it and then uh, you know, maybe you go low or maybe it doesn't come low. Maybe it just stays high. And you're, you're constantly like putting more and more effort into it, which is causing more and more problems sometimes. Um, and that then spills over into other things. Like maybe you're low, so you don't finish what you need to do for work, or you don't get to go for a run or do a workout you want to do, um, ruins a date night. Um, how do you, I don't know, how do you stop that snowball? I mean, it's hard because like you said, uh, everything, like you said, when, when something snowballs, um, it's easy to get caught up in what's happening and say, oh my God, this is happening. My blood sugar is high. My blood sugar is not coming down. And you know, what I tend to do when my blood sugar is high is I will look at my CPM every five minutes and say, it's not coming down. It's not coming down. And then I'll overcorrect and then I'll be low. And then that will in turn snowball into other things. So, um, I think really just taking a step back and saying, you know, one step at a time, let me correct and let me wait two hours before I rage bolus and try to bring myself down. Um, let me listen to my body and see, you know, if my sugar's high and I'm feeling crummy, maybe I'll lay down and I'll read a book. Or if I have things I need to do, maybe I'll prioritize the things that take up less energy physically and mentally. Um, and not having, you know, not engaging in that future predicting, thinking that, oh, my whole day is going to be ruined or, oh, this is going to lead to this because, you know, eventually that's going to cause those things to happen. Yeah. I want to, um, you know, you mentioned the, the Dexcom and this was a, you know, a feeling I had, oh, it's probably like last week. It was just a few days ago. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't that long that I felt like, you know, I'd gotten off my like diabetes, like rails where like everything was okay. And then like something changed and all of a sudden, um, you know, I would like eat lunch and I would take the same amount of insulin I would normally take and I would just plummet. And then I would, I would see the arrow going down and I was like, oh no, I don't want to go low. I'm going to eat something. So I have some like mango slices and then I shoot up right afterwards. Right. It just like flips. And then it's like, uh oh, I'm going to be high now. So I got to take insulin and bring it back down. Do yeah. you think that, I mean, you know, we all talk about how, you know, diabetes, especially with CGMs, you know, diabetes technology is a privilege, but it doesn't mean it's uh, all flowers and sunshine, right? There is kind of this, I don't know, this, this issue you could have yeah. with like too much information. Is that something yeah. you've seen? Yeah, absolutely. It's something that I feel like I talk a lot and I write a lot about because, you know, I, I, I mean, I didn't have a CGM until I want to say two or three years ago. And it's amazing how quickly it becomes like, you can't live without it. And there are times during that two hour warm up period where I'm like, what am I going to do? Like, I can't drive, I can't do this. And I have to really remind myself that I lived without this technology for the majority of my life and I was fine. And I definitely feel like it can, it can cause a lot of overreaction or early action, um, especially when you have it right on your watch or right on your screen. So something I try to do when I feel like I'm being too reactive is I'll turn it off of like quick view. So I can see, like I could, I can see that Dexcom is on my phone, but I can't see the numbers. Mm. Um, so in order to look at the numbers, I have to open my phone and I have to slide down and that, you know, inevitably leads me to look at it less. And sometimes I'll notice an improvement then in my numbers because I'm not overreacting to fluctuations that probably would be happening whether I knew about them or not. 
Um, something that I actually found really helpful, I think I was listening to Out of Range with you and Laura, and I remember she was talking about something similar and she said something about, you know, no sudden movements. So not seeing your numbers and immediately reacting, kind of saying, okay, wait a minute, let me just see how things go before I, you know, eat a snack and then go high and then have to correct and then go low. So again, really like pausing and getting some distance from that data too. Yeah, I, I definitely have noticed that the too much data, you want to try and, I don't know, like almost outthink diabetes. Like you're like, I can, you know, I can do this better. I can see I've gone down five points in five minutes. So that means this is going to happen. But it's, that's just like one piece of data. Like you, you know, that Dexcom doesn't tell you how much insulin you have on board, how much food you have on board, if you're going to go for a walk and all of these things, uh, you know, change that number. It was going to be in five more minutes. Not, it's not like it always just goes in a straight line. And I think one of the issues I was having is trying to get ahead of it and get ahead of the curve. And what I was doing is Oh, I was, I was going high, but it was, it was going to level off, Right. but I decided to take insulin ahead of time. And then it just leveled off and came back down or, or, you know, the end of my meal, the fat and protein was going to slow down and bring myself up. But I thought, no, it's not. I'm going to eat something quick acting and bring it back up. Yeah. It's kind of like, we're not giving our bodies and our insulin a chance to do what it's supposed to do. And, you know, doing the whole, like, I guess I would call it like, wait and see, like type of experiment, like just wait five more minutes and see what happens. And, you know, then in five more minutes, even though my arrow is going straight down, I see it goes like that. And then it goes like that. And I'm like, oh, wow. And then that kind of, that's a reinforcer to you. That it's a good thing I waited because just because I all of a sudden start dropping doesn't mean that I'm going to bottom out. Yeah. That, that reminds me of your, um, your hand experiment, where if, if all you see is the Dexcom number, mm-hmm. that's all you really see. And being able to give yourself some distance in, in this sense, time and kind of distance from like staring at the dots yeah. um, can really free you. Yeah, definitely. Um, we've got a, our first question uh, from the audience members. Uh, I find myself... Sab- I find myself sabotaging myself by binge eating. Usually I do this after having a treat, but not being satisfied by it. I try to dose for these episodes, but almost always go high. And my sugars are especially high in the morning, I guess, after the, after the, fa- after the treat. I then have guilt for this. And the whole thing is a vicious circle. Mm-hmm. Um, have you ever experienced this? How do you cope with this kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have, um, I, I think in general eating is a big struggle, you know, relationship to food, relationship to eating for people with diabetes. Um, I do have instances where I go low and it's the middle of the night and I have that fear response that I live alone. My blood sugar is really low. I have to eat everything in the kitchen. Or even if I'm not afraid, sometimes I'm just really hungry. Like when you're really low Um, and you have, you feel that like need to just eat everything in the kitchen. Um, but I think what's helped me with that is whether I'm low or I'm not low and I just really want to eat a lot. I'm really hungry. And I, I, you know, what I try to do is, you know, everyone talks about mindfulness now, but trying to be more present in your body. And that will of course be easier if your blood sugar is in range, but eating until you're full and counting your carbs because sometimes when we eat you know what would be considered a binge or eating a lot we don't count carbs because we're like oh this is going to be such a huge number I don't even want to see it and I don't even want to see how much insulin I would have to give for it and that's something that I definitely went through for a while when in reality you know you're eating you're, you're eating it anyway and you may as well just take insulin for it the right amount of insulin for it and if you do that you know, it leads, you know, it could prevent that high. And if you feel, you know, preventing that high can, yes, prevent that guilt, but, you know, guilt is a very 
deep, deep emotion that, you know, needs a lot of work and needs a lot of support to, to read, you know, reframe and to support through because at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's a terrible emotion to feel. And, uh, you know, food is food. I mean, food is not harming, you know, it's not significantly harming you if your sugar goes high, but it's not harming anyone else. And I think we tend to, as a society, demonize food where in reality, if you have one night where you have to eat all, or, you know, you just have this urge to eat a lot of food and then it is what it is. And if you, you know, all you could choose from there is how you move forward with it. Are you going to beat yourself up about it? Which ultimately will just make you feel bad and probably won't prevent it from happening again. Or you could just accept that that's what happened. I was really hungry and um, that's what I did. And, you know, be kind to yourself and be more accepting of what happened. You know, I'll say that, you know, from my own experience, I feel like food is one of the best parts of being alive as yeah. a person, right? Like, like you look what every other animal in the world eats. It's, it's berries and it's like raw flesh, right? That that's it. That's all they eat. Humans are the only animals who can come up with, you know, ice cream or cookies yeah. or cake or even, you know, steak or salad. And, and so we, um, you know, your, your point about diabetes and the food relationship, I think that's a very fraught one, um, only because it's so easy to, you know, have that guilt because you yeah. can see I ate this ice cream sandwich and I'm high now. Right. It's, it's my fault for eating that ice cream sandwich. I was the one who put that in my, my mouth. You know, no one held me down, stuffed ice cream down my throat. And then, you know, there's on top of that, the kind of, I don't know, institutional kind of shame for having high blood sugars, right? right. If, if you are out of range, you are a bad diabetic. And if you are a bad diabetic, you hate yourself. You want to, you know, have long-term complications because otherwise, why would you do that to yourself? Yeah. I think that's definitely a huge misconception with providers. And one of the things I, I do love about being a social worker in a hospital is that opportunity to work with doctors, nurses, um, you know, all other medical professionals and kind of, you know, gently providing that education and reframing to them that, you know, it's so easy for them to just say, oh, this patient's a bad diabetic. This patient's a non-compliant diabetic. Um, this patient isn't taking care. Like, oh, I've, oh, I hear it. I, and I, it's very harsh. And I'm like, does this only sound harsh to me? Like, cause I'm the only social worker around, but um, you know, what, what I try to say, or what I always think at least is that no person with diabetes wants to feel like crap and wants to get sick and not feel well. You know, the goal should not be berating them and telling them what they're doing wrong. The goal should be addressing what the barriers are, the barriers are to take them taking care of themselves, whether it's a psychological barrier or a financial barrier, or, um, you know, there's a lot of other concrete needs that people don't have. If, if somebody doesn't have stable housing or stable income, how are they gonna, you know, take their insulin every day or how are they gonna take it the way it's prescribed? So there's a lot of other things that we need to address. And like you said, with food, I mean, food is, like you said, it's one of the best things. And especially for different cultures, like, I mean, I'm Italian, I come from a big Italian family. So food is like everything for us. And I know that many other cultures, it's like that as well. And that's something that people have to consider when it comes to diabetes is that, you know, it's easy for providers or people to just say, well, you're diabetic, so you have to eat this and just disregard, you know, their upbringing and their culture and their socioeconomic status and, you know, not try to work with them and say, okay, well, what foods do you enjoy and what foods make you happy? And let's see how we can work with them. Um, and, you know, what food is accessible to you? Um, there's a lot of research about how, you know, 
healthy food's expensive to, to sum it up. So, you know, if you ever, if you go down the natural food aisle and stop and shop and look at the price tags on, it's like, it's expensive. So it's much easier to buy whatever's on sale and whatever's at the drive through if you, you know, are struggling financially. Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, going along with that, um, you know, you said, you said earlier, you know, we have the, we're making the choice to take care of ourselves. And I think that, you know, checking your blood sugar, recognizing your blood sugar is high and wanting it to be down is a healthy choice. Like you, you are wanting to be healthy. And I think that you shouldn't feel bad that you enjoyed something. Um, even if it was binge eating, I've, you know, plenty of times I've gone out and, you know, gone to a restaurant eaten a lot more than I would normally, you know, uh, if I was home alone, you know, eat a whole pizza, then have some ice cream on top and then maybe, you know, some more ice cream because I'm out. Um, and I think that you have to recognize that that is a fleeting moment. Right. And, and if you worry only about the blood sugar, um, as your measure of, of happiness or, or lack of guilt, then all you would do is not eat and not do anything. Like right. my blood sugars are best when I am starving and laying okay. in bed. Um, and that's not quite a life to live really. Um, but I, I guess for, to address sort of the guilt thing, how do we deal with that? How do we get rid of the sort of the diabetes guilt? I mean, it's I'd a very a social worker. Yeah. Guilt is a very complicated emotion. And I, I think particularly for diabetes, guilt is it's difficult to address because it's society wide. Like we've all seen all of those jokes about, you know, diabetes and, um, and food. And we all get those judgmental looks and, you know, remarks from professionals that feed into our guilt. And then, you know, that's not even taking into consideration our own upbringing. Um, you know, what kind of values were we taught as a child? Were we taught to not trouble anyone with anything? Because if so, then, you know, your guilt's going to probably skyrocket. But, and it's because it's such a deep emotion, you know, it's, it's very hard to eradicate, but, and it, it will take time, but, you know, guilt is something that could, whether it's with a therapist or with peer support, you know, that's something that really you have to work to address because it takes a lot of self-compassion, which isn't really in our nature always. And it's not really in our society's nature. You know, we're, we're a very like, well, pull yourself up and like shake it off and you'll be fine. You know, it's, it's only now coming up like, you know, things about self-care and being patient with yourself. And we have to really, you know, do that. And, and what can help is getting to the bottom of your guilt. So, you know, really examining, okay, you're feeling guilty, but what thought are you having prior to that feeling? Um, is your thought... I'm a failure because my blood sugar is high. And if it, if it is, then challenging that thought and saying, okay, my blood sugar is high. Diabetes is a very complicated disease. I tried my best. This is something maybe I could try next time. And it's, it's a lot of, you know, cognitive reframing. And the first step of that is really like paying attention to your automatic thoughts or your thoughts that really kind of flash into your head really quick without you even realizing it that then prompts like really strong feelings so that's that's the process but I, I would say that approach can really mitigate some of those feelings of guilt hmm. let's um let's talk a little bit about diabetes burnout um this is something almost probably everyone has dealt with to some degree at some point in their diabetes life um you know, I think anything could really cause diabetes burnout. Um, just having diabetes, eventually you burn out. Um, 
But, you know, for a lot of people, the issue is getting out of that, right? And it's, it's usually not until a doctor says, oh, you know, you've got floaters in your eye or your A1C is really high. Oh, you're starting to lose, fing- you know, feeling in your fingers or your toes. Um, and then it's, you know, too late. So how do we, how do we get out of diabetes burnout before um, bad things happen? Well, like you said, you know, any chronic stressful thing can lead to burnout. Um, funnily enough, or not funnily, but oddly enough, um, being a social worker, we learn a lot in school and in continuing ed about burnout because there's a very high burnout rate for social workers because the work you're doing is so emotionally draining and there's a lot of impossible situations that you then feel there's no good answers to and then, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And can we define, is there like a, a, not to interrupt you, but can we like define what burnout is? I think it's like a thing we all know, but maybe being able to kind of explain it can help us overcome it. I would say, I mean, to me, burnout is, I'm sorry, my cat is screaming at me because she wants to be fed. Um, uh, To me, burnout is just, you know, being done, being done with being irritable at the mention of your diabetes, um, not engaging in, you know, the things that you used to, to care for yourself or, you know, burnout in general, like I said, like being done that kind of like, oh, I'm over it. I don't care about it. I don't have any strong, like positive feelings about it. Um, there's, you know, lack of engagement. So not engaging with what you're supposed to do. Um, and you know, that, that pretty much sums it up. I'm sure I'm not defining it. I'm sure there's a, a definition out there somewhere, but you're right. It is something we talk about a lot that I think there's many different facets to it. Yeah. Um, so you were saying how, um, you know, social workers have a lot of burnout, uh, because of how emotionally draining it is. Yeah. So, you know, what, what we're kind of taught and, you know, it would be great if there was as much teaching for diabetics as there was for social workers. And I'm sure there's this, you know, similar stuff for doctors and other, you know, healthcare providers, because that is such a particularly draining field. But what we're usually taught is monitoring that, you know, like every so often checking in with yourself and saying, where am I at in terms of, you know, my diabetes? Um, Am I feeling okay? What's stressing me out the most? So even kind of doing a self-examination before you get to that really severe burnout, and you might notice that you're starting to be a little bit burnt out and you're like, okay, well, what can I do to address that? And then, you know, even like I said, like we talked about just getting distance from it. because when something is all consuming, I think that's what risk increases the risk for burnout. So whether that's, you know, taking a break from the, you know, Instagram, if you have a diabetes Instagram, or taking a break from your sensor, from your pump, um, and, or, you know, having your day consist more of things that, you know, give you joy. So like, if you like spending time with, animals or you like spending time outside or you know just really upping the self-care because the more you feel nourished you know not to sound cheesy but like in your heart and your soul the more of a protective factor that is that okay I have all of these other good things and good feelings to kind of boost me up yeah and then once let's say we get into burnout what are strategies we can use to get out of it I mean, I think it's, you know, it's similar really, but it, it, I think it requires, oh, sorry, it was my light, a lot of patience, which is very hard. It's much harder than it sounds, you know, being patient with yourself and being kind to yourself and, you know, listening to your body. So don't expect to, if you're in the middle of burnout and you're not testing at all, or you're not, you know, 
exercising at all or doing anything that you used to do, don't expect to go from zero to 60 in one day, you know, set, try to set maybe small goals for yourself and say, you know, I'm a big fan of lists and date books and writing things down, but say, okay, what is my one thing that I'm going to do to take care of myself today? Or, you know, two things. And then the next day, okay, what is my other thing I'm going to do? And, you know, praising, you know, praising yourself for that saying, okay, wow, I set a goal and I met it and that's great. And I should appreciate myself for that. And, you know, just building it up that way. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, you know, the Beta Cell Foundation is all about community. And so is there, how does community play into mental health? Yeah, I mean, I think community plays a huge role in mental health. I mean, I'm somebody who I consider myself an introvert. So despite that, um, I feel like community and other people and engaging with other people with diabetes made a significant impact on, you know, how I've handled and how, what my outlook is on diabetes. So quite literally growing up at diabetes camp and never knowing, I, I, I really was very lucky that I never had that feeling of I'm the only one like me, which is something I see very often in kids and teenagers with, and with diabetes um, that they think they're the only ones. And I, it's, it's almost like a foreign concept to me because I always knew I wasn't the only one because of my experience at camp. So that really set such a great, you know, base, base level of coping for me in that sense. Um, some people don't really want to engage in the community and that's okay. And, you know, maybe it's just engaging with one person who has diabetes, because I think even if you don't love to talk to other people and you don't love to share, um, it, you know, it doesn't mean that you have to go to a huge meetup and all these people, it could maybe mean, um, you know, going online and finding one person with diabetes and saying, oh, hey, like, I have diabetes too. Can I shoot some questions by you? Or, you know, asking your doctor or your, your kid's doctor, is there any, anyone else, you know, without it being a HIPAA violation, but, you know, sometimes doctors or different officers will have peer support programs and just trying it, you know, what I say, what I would say to people is just try something once, unless they're very, very set against it and see how it works for you because feeling alone and feeling isolated is a big risk for our mental health. And, you know, that experience of talking to others with diabetes and realizing they're going through similar things is just so powerful, such a powerful force against feeling alone and isolated that I don't think it, you know, it could really even be explained to someone. And that's why maybe people are sometimes hesitant because it's hard to even put into words how beneficial it could be. Yeah. Um, you know, we're getting towards the end here. So I was going to ask a question to anyone who wants to answer this in the chat and I'll answer it as well and make you answer it, Christy. But you, know, you said in your presentation how we've all kind of grown this year. Uh, it was a year no one could have expected. It kind of kept getting crazier and crazier, forced us to confront all of these, you know, issues with, you know, our routine, our lives, who we are, you know, what we do. Um, so my question for everyone is to think of a way that we have grown in this last year. Um, you know, what, what have we realized or done different? Maybe we started an exercise routine we didn't do before. Maybe we've taken time to meditate every day or do something we really love that we weren't doing. Um, you know, I, I had this thought, uh, you know, when you were doing your presentation of, I think this reminder that we don't have to be perfect all the time. And I think that's something that's really, I've thought a lot about, um, maybe not the whole year, probably took a few months of, you know, being at home and feeling like, oh, I can control everything because, you know, I don't have a commute. I don't have 
work, it's like, if I want to eat three Skittles, I can just go to the kitchen, eat three Skittles. If I have to take a half unit of insulin, I can do that. I can, you know, I could control all of these factors because I'm in this bubble. Um, but clearly that didn't work. Like, you know, there's all these other things going on and your body just decides to do whatever. And I think I've been able to give myself a little bit of breathing room in the sense of like, I've given my diabetes a little bit of breathing room. Like mm -hmm. I can go up and down a little bit, you know? And I think it's, it's, you know, when you, when you move your hand back, I'm going to keep using this now. Cause I think this is just a great analogy. Okay. Like, you know, when you're, when you're looking at that three hour window of your Dexcom, right. And it can look really bad. And then you zoom out and you're like, Oh, you know, the day is not that bad. Right. Like I'm pretty much in range the whole day. Right. Even if it's just on my way to other locations. Um, and that's kind of what I've learned a bit. Yeah. I don't know if there's anything you've, I'm putting you on the spot now. No, I mean, I think it's been, yeah, it's been incredibly difficult this, this year, last year, you know, especially being in a hospital and that fear um, and that lack of control of, you know, seeing other people suffering and, and being kind of powerless to do much of anything. And there's this quote that I really love uh, from Fantastic Beasts. And it, I have it up in my room and it says suffering, suffering means you worry, no. Worrying means you suffer twice. And I think I really kind of grew into that this year that whatever is going to happen is going to happen. And there are things that we can't control you know, there are things that we can control, like, you know, wearing a mask and, you know, checking our blood sugar and, you know, whether it's COVID or diabetes. Um, and, but there are certain things that outside of that we can't control and that we can't, you know, if we worry about them, they're still going to happen or they're not going to happen. And, you know, ultimately we could just worry about them when they do happen. And then we only have to worry one time. So it takes a lot of, I think practice and experience to get to that point, but I do feel like living in all of this uncertainty this past year, especially really kind of got me to that point where, cause there was really no other option. I mean, there, there would be no way to function working in a hospital if I was constantly worried about what was gonna happen. And that kind of is how I think I've grown through this. Yeah. More, more living in the moment, maybe, as opposed to worrying about things you can't control in the future. Yeah. Um, this has been great, Christy. Uh, I've learned a lot. I hope everyone else has learned a, a bit too. Um, you know, for people who have sort of just started thinking about, you know, mental health, maybe want to do things, you know, differently in 2021, or people who have been struggling for something for a while and are sort of looking for answers, what are next steps do you think people can take to sort of get a handle on yeah. the relationship with mental health and diabetes? Yeah. So next steps, I mean, um, as far as, I, I mean, I think honestly, everyone could benefit from therapy. It's one of those things that is still pretty stigmatized, um, but I think is becoming less so. So, you know, and it doesn't have to be like people think it doesn't have to be forever. It doesn't have to be very time consuming. Um, you know, engaging in therapy might mean one 45 minute session a week. Um, and virtually everyone is doing telehealth therapy now. So it's pretty convenient for some people that might be more awkward, you know, but everybody's different, but first steps, I would say, you know, you could always ask your, if you have a good relationship with your primary care provider, if they know of anyone or any referrals. Um, if not, you know, I'm a social worker, so I'm very like pragmatic when I think about this, but I think about, you know, if you have private insurance, there's a phone number on the back of your card that says, you know, member services. There's usually a number that says behavioral health too. And you could get a list of different like in-network therapists, that are in the area, get a big list because sometimes it won't be totally accurate. So it's good to have a lot of options. And then if you have Medicaid or state insurance, um, there's lots of resources through the county. 
uh, I think people really underestimate uh, or underrate Google. You could probably find a therapist that way very easily as well. Like therapists that take Medicaid, therapists that take X, Y, Z. Um, so it's, it's, it's fairly easy. It's just, you know, taking that first step mentally can be scary. And I, I usually tell people that it'll be awkward at the beginning. It's awkward. It's kind of like dating. Like you have to go and kind of open up to this person and it's a little awkward. And you should though, after the first session, maybe get a first sense of, of a little bit of a sense of, am I comfortable with this person? And maybe you're not. And then you try a different therapist. Maybe you are. And as time goes on, you know, it, it can be a really good resource and a really good support for you. I know there are apps now. I think the names don't come to my head. Better. Yeah. Talk better speed. Help. Yeah. Thrive works. Uh, Where you can just go on your phone, do a telehealth right through there. Um, yeah. Makes it more convenient than having to feel like you're going to a building and yeah. like, what if someone sees me in the waiting room? No one's going to see you in the waiting room. Like all those like things in your head, right? Of like, you can just literally from your couch, talk to someone for 30 yeah. minutes, 45 minutes, and then decide if it's worth it. Right. Yeah. It's, it's made it for a lot of people, the telehealth has made it a lot more convenient and most insurances because of COVID are covering it. I think it's like a new, I don't know, federal law or something. Hmm. Well, that's one good thing to come out of 2020, I guess. Yeah. Um, thank you again. Um, this has been great. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we're going to have another one of these on a slightly different topic next month. Uh, it's the third Sunday of every month. I think that's the 17th. Um, it'll be at the same time, 3 p.m. If you think Sundays at 3 p.m. are a good time or a bad time, let me know. Shoot me an email. I'm craig at betacellfoundation.org. Uh, if you have any questions or thoughts, um, email. Find us on Instagram. Facebook, Twitter, all the places. Um, and if you have thoughts for future topics or other things you want, um, don't be shy. Thank you again. Uh, I hope everyone has a great three-day weekend who gets tomorrow off. Um, and here's to a good 2021. Yes, fingers crossed. Thanks, Christy. Thank you.